if we want to simulate the mechanical behavior of matter, we have to somehow come up with the relationship between the stresses and strains in the material. If a certain stress is acting on a tiny volume element, we want to know how much the element deforms. And vice versa, if an element is deformed, we want to quantify the stresses acting on the element. Such a relation between stresses and strains is called a constitutive equation or material model. Finding a good model for the relation between stresses and strains is not at all easy. It highly depends on the material under consideration and on the external influences the material is subjected to. In this video we will talk about the simplest material model, the linear elastic material model. I'm sure you are familiar with the linear elastic material model in 1D, which simply assumes a linear relation between the scalar stress and the scalar strain. In this model, the Young's modulus capital E is a material parameter that must be determined from experiments. But how can we formulate a linear elastic material model in 3D? In 3D, the stress and the strain are described by 3x3 three three tensors. A somewhat naive idea would be to simply assume that the stress tensor is equal to the Young's modulus times the strain tensor. But there's a catch. This model is a bit too idealized to describe the mechanical behavior of matter. This becomes clear when we implement this naive model in a simulation. Here I'm simulating the compression of a solid cube. At first glance, the results of the simulation look quite realistic. But when we take a closer look, we observe something odd. When we compress an object in one direction, we typically expect the object to expand in the other directions. This is called Poisson effect. The reason behind the Poisson effect is that most materials show a higher resistance to a change in volume than to a change in shape. When we compress the cube, the material resists changing its volume and therefore bulges to the sides. A similar effect is expected under tension. When we pull on an object, the material resists to change its volume and should therefore get slimmer. It seems that the naive model fails to describe the Poisson effect, so let's take a closer look at what the naive model is doing. The naive model assumes that the stress is equal to a material parameter times the strain. In the previous video we have learned that the strain can be split into one contribution that describes the pure volume change and another contribution that describes the pure shape change. Let's substitute this volumetric deviatoric split into the naive model. We observe that both the volumetric and the deviatoric part of the strain are multiplied by E and therefore they contribute equally to the stress. This means that the naive model assumes that the material has the same resistance to both volume change and shape change. And this is exactly why the naive model fails to describe the Poisson effect. To accurately model the Poisson effect, we introduce two different material parameters, which I will denote as E-vol and E-def. In this way, the volumetric and deviatory part of the strain contribute differently to the stress. These parameters can be determined from experiments. As most matters are more resistant to volume change than to shape change, we typically observe that E-vol is greater than E-def. What we have arrived at is the linear elastic material model in 3D. We can implement it in the simulation of the solid cube and we observe now the expected Poisson effect. All we had to do was to change our model from a model with one parameter to a slightly more complicated model with two parameters. Please note that the parameters evol and edef that I have introduced here are not commonly used in mechanics. Instead, you might have heard about the so-called bulk modulus K, which is defined as one-third of Evol, and the so-called shear modulus G, which is defined as one-half of Edef. But this is just a rescaling of parameters, which has no influence on the model at all. The physical meaning of the bulk and shear moduli becomes clearer if we compute the volumetric and deviatoric part of the stress. The volumetric stress is simply 3k times the volumetric strain and the deviatoric stress is simply 2g times the deviatoric strain. 
But why are these relations true? I will show you why the first relation is true and leave the proof of the other equation as an exercise for you. By simply substituting the linear elastic model for the stress, we find that the volumetric stress is equal to the volumetric part of 3k times the volumetric strain plus 2g times the deviatoric strain. Because all the operations on the right hand side of the equation are linear operations, the order in which we apply these operations does not matter. Therefore the right hand side can be rearranged to 3k times the volumetric part of the volumetric strain plus 2g times the volumetric part of the deviatoric strain. The volumetric part of the volumetric strain is simply the volumetric strain. And because the deviatoric strain is volume preserving, the volumetric part of the deviatoric strain is zero. And this is the reason why the volumetric stress is equal to 3k times the volumetric strain. The way we derive the linear elastic model is a bit unusual, but I really like this way of deriving the linear elastic model, because we started with a reasonable but somewhat naive idea, we realized that this naive idea failed to model the Poisson effect, and we adapted the model accordingly. But perhaps in your solid mechanics class you have seen a different derivation, one that involves a so-called stiffness matrix. So let's see if we can bring the model into a form that is probably more familiar to you. To do this we expand the formula of the linear elastic model. After some rearrangements we arrive at nine equations, one for every stress component. Because both the stress and the strain tensor are symmetric, three of the nine equations are redundant, so let's forget about those. The remaining six equations can be written like this in matrix vector format. Here I have gathered all independent components of the stress tensor in one vector and all independent components of the strain tensor in another vector. This is called void notation. The stress in void notation is equal to a matrix times the strain in void notation. This matrix is called the stiffness matrix. It is often abbreviated with capital C. Note that it is a common convention to move the factors of two in the latter three diagonal components of the stiffness matrix into the strain vector. This only affects the definitions of the stiffness matrix and the strain and void notation, but it doesn't change the overall formula. With the derived formula for the linear elastic model, we can compute the stress for a given strain. But what if you want to compute the strain for a given stress? This is pretty much straightforward if we recall that the volumetric stress is 3k times the volumetric strain and the deviatoric stress is 2g times the deviatoric strain. By dividing by 3k and 2g respectively, we get formulas for the volumetric and deviatoric strain. This means that the strain is equal to 1 over 3k times the volumetric stress plus 1 over 2g times the deviatoric stress. As we have done earlier in this video when deriving the stiffness matrix C, we can now bring this equation into void notation. If we do so, we find that the strain in void notation is equal to a matrix S times the stress in void notation. This matrix is called the compliance matrix and it is the inverse matrix of the stiffness matrix. As an exercise, try to derive how the components of the compliance matrix can be computed dependent on the bulk and shear moduli. With this we reach the end of this video. Finally, please note that we have focused on isotropic material behavior in this video. This means the linear elastic model that we have derived is only appropriate for materials whose mechanical behavior is independent on the loading direction, as it is the case for example for many metals and polymers. For such materials many entries in the stiffness and compliance matrix are equal. For anisotropic materials, like wood or composite materials, the stiffness and compliance matrix have more independent components. But we will discuss this in another video. Stay tuned, bye!